From the Middle East to Central and South Asia to Africa, hundreds of thousands of children keep paying, potentially, the highest price as armed conflict and instability continue to spread. According to the UN, last year brought a spate of grave violations against children in conflict zones across the globe. And the projections for 2022 are not very promising despite decades of advocacy by NGOs. One of those international organizations is Save the Children. It works to improve children's lives around the world, ensuring they have health care, food and shelter, as well as learning and protection services when children need it most. But to many of those in need, NGOs have failed to successfully make a difference in their lives. Save the Children has not been exempted from this criticism. Its CEO, Inger Ashing, recently traveled to Burkina Faso as many miners living in the Central Sahel region face the risk of illegal recruitment by non-state armed groups. And that's where we caught up with her. Inger Ashing, Chief Executive Officer of Save the Children, talks to Al Jazeera. Inger Ashing, CEO of Save the Children International, thank you for talking to Al Jazeera. Now we're in Ouagadougou, the capital of Burkina Faso, and beyond this capital, there's an increasing violence, conflict that's at play. What's happening? I mean, this is a place that even journalists are not being able to access. The north of the country, central Mali, we've seen terrible attacks. What's going on in these areas? You've just visited those sites. What we see is an increased uh, escalation of violence and, and the insecurity, and uh, a huge number of, of people have been forced to flee their homes because of the violence. We have over 1.4 million dis internally displaced people in the country. So it is a real, real challenge here. And it's something that this country hasn't experienced before. So it's, it's, it's uh, really difficult for, the, for children and, and the families around. Uh, we are doing a lot to try to respond and working in close partnership with the government, nationally, regionally, and uh, in the provinces, and with local partners to make sure that we are responding to the increasing needs of children. In terms of accessing those that are displaced, um, are you able to access those that need your help? There are certain aid agencies that have been withdrawn their ability to, to, to operate here in Burkina Faso. Have you been able to work with those that need it the most? Yes, we, we still have access to, to these areas and, and uh, I, I do think it is because of our long presence in the country. We've been here for 40 years and also our very good relationship with the government and uh, the fact that we're working through local partners. So we do have access and, and we are trying to, to respond by making sure that we are providing education because uh, already before the crisis, uh, the, more than 50% of the children in this country were out of school. And due to, to the increased violence, many, many children are, are facing uh, a situation where schools are closing and they have no access. So, so we are having programs in different parts of the country to try to respond. So you're saying half of the children in Burkina Faso are currently not in school? Before the situation, the escalated uh, conflict, 50% were out of school. Now, what are the consequences to that? That means that, I mean, school, we know that education is, is the, the, the most important thing uh, for children, both to protect them now, but also for the future. So lack of access to education will mean that they are at greater risk of, of child marriage. And that's already a big challenge in this country with over 52% 50, being married before their, before their 18th birthday uh, and, um, and a lot of them before their 15th birthday. So it's, it's an increased risk for child marriage, it's increased risk for poverty and it also means that we are robbing them of, of their future. Now we've met some children who are displaced now in Ouagadougou in school and they tell us that their schools are systematically targeted by groups such yeah. as ISIL affiliates or Al Qaeda affiliates and that teachers are being gunned down. But more than that, what was what some of the children are telling us is that children are sometimes being recruited by armed groups. How do you explain that? Again, it is a real challenge in conflict that, that children are, they are trying to recruit children. And uh, one of the biggest things that we can do, or one of the most important things we can do to try to protect them is to offer them proper education, because that is, is something that will keep them protected and, and have, have them uh, 
being able to focus on something else. But it is a big issue, and, and we talked about it with government when, in, in some of the meetings that I have had. They're, they are very concerned about the situation, and so are we. But we do know that the, the main response that we should put in place is, is proper access to education. Is the government doing that? Are they actually reopening schools in areas where children need it? The government, in my view, I mean, the people I've met uh, are, are really, um, really, really committed to, to try to support and help uh, children in this country. And I've, I've met local uh, district uh, directors uh, for education, for humanitarian affairs. I've also had a meeting with the president. So, so I do think that there's a genuine commitment to do this. But it's incredibly difficult. And this is a, a poor country that's already struggling. But with the help of, of organizations like Save the Children, they are doing it. And, and uh, we, are, we have opened a number of schools and we are supporting them. Now, there seems to be a wave of discontent among many young people throughout uh, the Sahel and, and countries in the Sahel in areas where the population are mostly young people and their leaders are sometimes above the age of 70. There almost seems to be a generational gap between the leaders of these countries and this population here. And a lot of dissatisfaction in terms of what their governments are doing, but not just the governments, there's also dissatisfaction towards the aid, aid industry and the dialogue that there is. One young lady was, was saying that, you know, that people here in the Sahel or in Africa don't need more aid. They need partnership. Now, you're a big organization. Save the Children have been, as you said, have been around for a long time. What role do you have to play in this? I, I absolutely, th I think they're right. It, it, it is about building long-term partnerships. And that is what we as an organization do. So we do partner with local organizations. Uh, and and if, if we talked about the, the displaced people in, in, in Dori, I mean, we, we work through local organizations in Dori. We work with the government in Dori. And I think that's the only way that we could and should engage as, as, as part of the aid industry. And there's a lot of conversations and, and very good conversations about the need for us to localize our responses. And, and th there will be a huge shift in the coming years on how we uh, respond in humanitarian crisis and how we, we, we uh, work in, in the long-term development. And it will have to be through partnerships in the countries where we work, because our only ambition and aim is to make sure that we are creating a, a future for the children in Burkina Faso, Sahel and elsewhere. And we can only do that by investing in, in relationships locally. But beyond those relationships, I mean, this is something that the aid industry has done before in the past. What has changed? There, genuinely, you know, when, when you speak to young people here and they see these, you know, Save the Children or other aid agencies in the big SUVs coming by, taking a few pictures and then leaving, there's a lot of resentment towards that. What are you going to do to change that? I think one of the absolute most, most important things is, again, to, to work in partnerships and, and truly show that that is what you do. We are not here to help them. We are here to support them to help themselves. Uh, and, and I think that's an important difference. We are, and we are not leaving. We've been here for 40 years. We will continue to be here. Uh, we are in, in many parts of this country uh, responding to the, to the, to the needs. And, and the majority of, of our staff are our local people. I mean, people from Burkina Faso, and that is the way it should be. So, so we are not one of these organizations that come in, drive past, and then leave. And, and not in this country and nowhere. Now, it's become increasingly difficult for, for Save the Children and other aid agencies to work in certain areas, yeah. certain countries, whether it be Ethiopia, even here in Burkina Faso, the government has revoked the, you know, the ability for some aid agencies to operate, and in other parts of the world. Given this, this shrinking of space for you to operate, how do you do it? How, what can you do? What is your margin of maneuver? Shrinking space is an absolute challenge for, for the whole sector. And, and we see that uh, increasingly in, in most parts of the world, and it, it is a real challenge. And the lack of, of humanitarian access will put millions and millions of, of people's lives in danger. Uh, so I, I don't think we, I mean, you, you can't underestimate the threat that that means. Uh, but for us, it, it is through being a true partner and, and a respectful partner in the countries where we work uh, that we will make sure that we have the, the right relationships to, to maintain access. There's also a lot of conversations within the 
INGO sector about how we collectively can, can challenge this um, and how we can get member states that are more, more open and democratic to, to influence their peers and have the UN engage, etc. But um, this is one of the biggest challenges that we're facing, lack of access to help. In, in places like Afghanistan, I mean, you've came up with a report quite recently that the health system is on the verge of collapse. What are the consequences to that and how do you work with, with those in power in Afghanistan to reach those in need? Afghanistan is of course a very uh, recent and, and difficult uh, situation uh, where all, almost every INGO had to close down when the Taliban took over. We were working very much in, in partnership with the previous government in Afghanistan, so a lot of the, uh, the projects we have, the programs that we do, we, we do in government uh, schools, etc. Uh, so with the Taliban's in power, that, that of course means that we need to assess and, and look at what can we do now uh, and, and, and what is our ability to program in a country like Afghanistan. But we, the, Afghani, uh, the Taliban, they were in power before, and, and I think we and many other organizations have been working during Taliban rule before, so, so I think it's not impossible to do, but it's, it, 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 it's different. And there's a couple of really core values that we will not compromise with. We will not compromise when it comes to our ability to have female staff, for example, for our ability to still reach goals, because we know that they are the most vulnerable in Afghanistan and elsewhere. Uh, so, and we have opened up our work in, in a couple of provinces in, in Afghanistan, but it, it's a lot of negotiations, a lot of, of difficult situations and, and conversations needed. So, coming back to here, where yeah. we are in the Sahel, yeah. whether it be Mali, Burkina Faso or Niger, what are the projects, what are you doing in these areas where um, ISIL affiliates or Al-Qaeda affiliates are operating? How are you able to operate there and what exactly are you doing there? So the three things that we do in this region, but also in, in, in the rest of the world, is, is focus on education, access to education, because that is, as I said before, one of the core <laughs> interventions that we can and should take to, to make sure that children have a future. The other thing is around protection, uh, and that is, for example, making sure that schools are safe, uh, and we are working a lot. Uh, th th there's an uh, international agreement around a safe for school declaration that we are advocating hard to, to get governments and warring parties to agree to so that they will not attack schools and that they are safe for children. Uh, we are working very much with gender-based violence, child marriage and, and things like that because we do know that increased conflict and lack of access to education will lead to increase in child marriage and this region is, is absolutely one of the worst regions in the world when it comes to child marriage with over 50% in this country being married before their 18th birthday. Uh, we also work on, on health and nutrition because we know that the few, um, Burkina Faso is also a country where there's a huge uh, increase in food insecurity. And, and if we look at Africa, the food insecurity situation, I mean, it was a 60% uh, increase in, in food insecurity in the region last year. So it seems like it's going from bad to worse. Yes. And, and, and in terms of the, you, you're both dealing with both a humanitarian yeah. uh, situation, but also operating in a conflict zone. For children, what does that mean? I mean, ch children, I think for them, of, of course, th this country ha has been f facing a lot of challenges even before the conflict. And with the conflict, the situation is getting worse in every area, I would say, uh, with uh, more children being out of school, more children being married early, food insecurity and, and lack of, 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 of future. Uh, I, I think for children, I, what we need to do is to provide immediate help uh, and make sure that they get access to, to what they need to survive and, and be educated, but also invest in long-term uh, solutions. Because I, I think we, we talked about how the world is changing and, and the shrinking space and the increased humanitarian crisis in the world. And, and what I'm worried about is that we are focusing so much on the humanitarian crisis that we forget the long-term de development. And, and going back to Afghanistan, I mean, with all the governments redrawing their support to, to the government, we talk about billions of dollars and the humanitarian response will only be a small, small percentage of that. So, so th there is an absolute need to do both the long-term investments and the humanitarian responses. And I think that's, that's the way that we are creating a future for children. Between the promises made by rich countries and their actual fulfillment, there's, there's a huge gap. They promise billions of dollars, but in reality, maybe there's $100 million or something like that. I mean, this, this 
this gap in funding? First of all, why is it happening? Why are they not fulfilling their commitments? And what consequences does that have in terms of children who need help? The funding gap is, is an absolute challenge. Uh, why they are not fulfilling their promises, I, I think you need to ask them. Due to COVID conflict and, and the climate crisis, we see that a lot of the, the progress we've seen in the last 20 to 25 years are now reversed. Uh, so the, the situation has never been as serious as it is today. And that is what we are telling them. Uh, we, we are telling them about the, the, the situation being bad even before COVID and uh, climate and, and uh, conflict. And um, that is only becoming worse. So I think we have a very strong case because we have millions uh, of, of hundreds of millions of children out of school uh, worldwide. We have the worst uh, food insecurity crisis that we've ever seen coming in many countries around the world. And, and uh, I, as I talked about before, the, 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 the number of, of children being uh, married as children is, is, is also increasing. And 22,000 children uh, every year die every year because of uh, early uh, childbirth and, and that's 60 children a day. Now in terms of child marriages yeah. and even trafficking, there's a lot of trafficking of young girls out of Burkina Faso to neighboring countries such as Côte d'Ivoire and elsewhere. What are you doing to tackle these issues? I'm, I'm going to return to the education answer but, I, but because that is the answer. But, but schools are closing down as you explained. Yeah. yeah but we need to make sure that they are reopening and we need to make sure that we are giving them temporary uh, education um, possibilities and, and options so and, and that's that's what we do I mean in, uh, in in some of the areas where we work we, we are working with the current schools to, to make sure that they can take in more of the internally di displaced children but we are also making sure that we are providing non-formal or informal education to to, to support the children that do, do not have access to school or to support them and, and work more. But, but, but also, of course, when it comes to child marriage, it is about providing an option. Uh, it is about education. It is about poverty. So, so we are also doing quite a lot of cash transfers to make sure that, that families can get by and that they can buy food and, and buy clothing and everything that they need to, to, to survive. Uh, and then they might not feel the, the, that they are forced to marry off the, the, their girls. Uh, but then it's, it's also about legislation, it's, it's about the mindset shift and norms and values. So, so we're trying to address all these at the same time. Now, the United Nations has reported about um, sexual violence against young girls, not just by armed groups, but also by people that are meant to protect those young girls, whether it be UN peacekeepers. Um, I've been in Central African Republic where we've met 12-year-old girls that could recognize the tattoo of the regiment of the French soldier that had abused her. We spoke to the lawyers that were defending these young girls. All of the cases that they put forward to judges and to the tribunal were dismissed, even the ones by Paris prosecutors. The lawyer told me, imagine if there was African soldiers in Paris violating young French girls, how the world would react. And yet here there seems to be an element of impunity. Why is that? And are you doing anything to address that? that that's a very serious uh, situation and completely unacceptable. And, and as you say, we've, we've seen too many uh, situations where this has happened and where the people that are here to protect people are, are the, the, the perpetrators and, and uh, violating them. Uh, so so it, it, it is absolutely part of, of what we are trying to address. Uh, in, in the, there's, there's quite a lot of... of uh, collaborations around uh, humanitarian responses. So Save the Children is, is part of one of these big coalitions and, and one of our core uh, focuses is uh, safeguarding of children because we need to make sure that children are always safe when, when we are engaged and we also need to, to make sure that they are safe when they are engaged with others. So, so, so um, this is completely unacceptable. We need to hold people accountable for what they do, uh, regardless of where it happens. And sexual violence against children is never accepted, nowhere, and by no one. And, and yet there's so little prosecution happening. I mean, there's been a lot of scandals here in Africa about aid agencies being involved in, in sexual, uh, you know, exchanging aid against uh, against food. There's been scandals even at Save the Children at a corporate level, Save the Children UK, about sexual harassment. And, and there's, if you speak to people in the streets, there's this notion and there's this fear of these white, 
aging males that come to Africa to save children and yet that are some of them abusing the children that they're meant to protect. What is being done to address this? So internally, uh, we, we spend a lot of time uh, addressing this because, as I said, everyone, every child needs to be safe when they are around Save the Children. So for us, it's, a, it's about having zero tolerance, it's having the right policies in place, it's about holding people internally accountable, making sure that people report even the, the smallest thing that, that is done, and, and making sure that we are act if things happen. Uh, and, and I don't think we, we can never prevent things from happening, but we can always make sure that we are doing everything we can to, to minimize it, and also that we respond when it happens and hold people accountable and support the victims. Uh, in Save the Children, we haven't had cases of, of uh, us, 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 the ones that you described with our people abusing uh, children, but, but we did have a, a sexual harassment scandal between staff, and, and uh, so that, that's also something that we spend a lot of time addressing in the last few years, because that's also something that is not acceptable. It should be safe for staff and children to be part of, of uh, our work. What about, you know, governments? Are you holding governments accountable for their staff or their involvement in sexual harassment or sexual abuse? One of the things that, that we as an organization focus on is, is, of course, holding governments account for every violation of children's rights. And this is one of the violations. So, so in our work on, on advocacy and, and making sure that we are pushing and, and uh, working with governments to, to Im improve. Uh, the, their accountability for children's rights is, is absolutely very high on the agenda and with, this is one part of it. I think we need to spell it out for our viewers. Yeah. What are those children's rights? What are the rights that our children, w in whichever country they are, in this world, what do they deserve and what are their rights? There, there is a convention of the rights of the child, but of course I will not go to, into the details around that. But it's mainly about making sure that children are, are safe, that children are protected from, from violence, abuse, etc., that children have the right to, to uh, health uh, and, and uh, the right to education, uh, the right to, to an identity and, and, and a number of things like that. How much is the humanitarian um, crisis that we're seeing in the Sahel due to climate change. Has climate change a role in, in the conflicts that we're seeing in, in the Sahel? We're seeing herders fighting with, with farmers. No, but I, I would say that many, many of the conflicts we see in the world, including in this region, are, are, are affected by climate because the resources are getting more and more scarce and, and, and the conflicts are arising due to that. So climate shocks is something that you're wary of in the future? Absolutely, because we do know that climate shocks and, and climate risks will lead to, to challenges in, in people's everyday life here and now, but it is also an, an increased risk for, for conflict due to that. And we've talked a lot about how dire the situation is for many young children, but there are some that make it out. How do they make it out? What are the tools that help them to, to survive and to make it out in given the circumstances of the picture that you've drawn for us? I think one of the, the most important things that we can do to, to support children is, is to, to help them build their own resilience and, and uh, education is one part of it, but not the full story. Uh, the other day I, I met a girl here in Burkina Faso who, who, who shared her story about how she was married off when she was 12 years old to a 54 year old man. He already had four wives and she was promised to him at birth she, she was forced to marry him. She, she managed to escape because she wanted to finish school. Uh, she, she walked for, for days. She walked 40 kilometers. She was then found and brought back to her husband. And he told her that he would chain her until she gave him a child. She managed to escape again. And again, walked for days until she came to a center where they were protecting child rights. And now she is studying to become a nurse. And, and when I asked her what her advice is for, for other uh, children, it is to be courageous, to, to believe in yourself and never give up. And I think we need to, to make sure that we are giving children that ability to, to fight for themselves and their right, because that is what will help them. Uh, and they are incredibly resilient, but we need to support them to be able to do their part of and, and, and get out of the very difficult situations. If you have any message to give to some of the children that are maybe watching this, this program and are facing challenges, whether it be food insecurity, sexual abuse, or any other challenges that young children 
are facing, especially in the Sahel region or in other areas of conflict. What would be that advice that you would give them? I will quote the girls that I spoke to earlier this week, because I asked them what they, their advice would be. And they, they said, and I say the same, make sure that you do, every, do everything in your power to, to, to get a proper education. And, and do, if, if you're in a difficult situation, ask for help, because there's a lot of people that are willing to help and support you. Inger Ashing, Chief Executive Officer for Save the Children International, thank you very much for talking to Al Jazeera. Thank you.